Hey everyone, I'm Jeff Haynes, Senior Editor, Head of Games and Digital at Common Sense Media, and I'm here today with a quick look at Dead Space. It's a game that came out on January 27th, 2023 for the PlayStation 5, Xbox Series X and S, and Windows PC. Now a quick note of warning for all parents and caregivers, this is a mature survival action horror game that features a lot of blood, gore, and intense violent scenarios. It also has a lot of mature language that definitely is not suitable for younger gamers. We tried to cut out what we could, where we could within this particular look, but in some cases it's absolutely unavoidable because it is part of the nature of the gameplay. If you happen to have any questions about what you'll see within this video or any other form of media, be sure to go over to our website at commonsensemedia.org where we have a full breakdown of this game or anything else that you might be interested in. So what exactly is Dead Space? Well, the 2023 game is a remake and remaster of a game that was originally released in 2008, and it features a couple really notable, really substantial uh, enhancements, not the least of which is to say the, the graphical fidelity has been boosted significantly for, to take advantage of the, the latest uh, game systems and consoles. In this particular title, you play Isaac Clark, an engineer who, as you could see a few seconds ago, gets a message from his girlfriend, Nicole, who happens to be stationed on the USG Ishimura, which is a mining platform out in deep space. Now, Isaac and his crew wind up uh, going out because they get a, a message basically saying that the Ishimura has basically uh, lost communication with the network that happens to be overseeing a, a lot of their uh, their operations, but unfortunately for Isaac and, and the crew that he's with, uh, as they approach the issue more, they seem to suffer some kind of electrical malfunction or ship uh, issue. There happens to be some kind of problem, and what winds up happening, as you can see on screen, is they get pulled in and they crash eventually into the Ishimura. In fact, they wind up crash landing onto its deck that kind of strands them there until they can figure out not only the damage to their own ship, but also find out what possibly is going on within, with uh, upon the Ishimura itself so that they can hopefully fix whatever the problem is and get back to their superiors. Of course, if you've played any uh, sci-fi action game, any horror game, seen any horror movie or sci-fi movie, you know that anything routine, whether it happens to be a repair, or search and rescue, etc., it's never a routine uh, circumstance. It's always more complicated. In fact, right here, as you can see, Isaac winds up going uh, into the ship along with uh, some of his uh, crewmates, uh, Aiden and Zach. And, and uh, one of the problems of course that they wind up uh, finding is uh, there's a huge damage report of the Ishimura that shows a lot of the sequences, a lot of the, the areas on the ship happen to be offline. Not only that, but it seems to definitely be crippled by something or some things that happen to be uh, stranding it out there in the middle of nowhere. But unfortunately for them, there's an even worse problem. There's nobody around. Klaxons are going off. There's some really odd slithering or noise that seems to be going off uh, around them. And as Zack and Aiden are literally trying to find out what's going on, of course, there's no human being around to fill them in on what happens to be wrong, but they just see a biohazard sign flashing on the screens. Of course, they wind up opening fire because something seems to attack, and unfortunately for Aiden, he gets impaled by some kind of creature with blades for arms and then ripped apart. Again, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this, there's a lot of blood and gore that you're going to wind up finding as you're playing the game. In fact, we're going to leap a little bit farther ahead where Isaac is simply running for his life simply because he doesn't have a weapon or at this part in time. He just landed on the ship. The only thing he really came with was a toolbox so that he could uh, figure out what was going on. But unfortunately, all of these monsters are coming at him. And as you can see right here, one tries to claw its way into the elevator only to be split in half and splatter itself across uh, Isaac's visor and his suit, uh, thereby leaving the elevator elevator kind of covered in gore. It might seem a little bit gratuitous, it might seem a little bit over the top, but in many ways that actually is part of the gameplay. In fact, it actually is part and parcel of what is going on. What you eventually discover over the course of the game is that the creatures that you run into happen to be called necromorphs. And these aren't like normal monsters that you might wind up fighting in any particular game. In fact, these creatures that seem to be dead but also mutated into some uh, odd little zombie kind of thing seem to mutate after a while. And as you can see, written on the wall in blood, cut off their limbs kind of gives you a sense of what you need to do. In fact, as Isaac gets the plasma cutter, which is a, a an engineering welding tool, 
which he's going to repurpose as a, a gun or a weapon to use to blast off limbs, to blast off heads or other things. The, the ability to use these weapons to dissect and section off other parts are really important, mainly because uh, if you don't try to split off their limbs, they will mutate into some other form and come at you stronger with completely different attacks. For instance, if you wind up shooting uh, these creatures in the chest, they will just grow additional arms and start throwing bones at you. Or they might grow additional legs to charge at you in, in a running uh, ability to move faster than you were expecting. It really behooves you to pay attention to what's going on. So unfortunately for that crewman, he was attacked and it, we're going to take the time to try to blast off this monster's legs, throwing it back so that we have a little additional space and then kind of chopping off the arms and, and, and eventually the head. Now, one other thing that you'll see right here is we'll also stomp on the creature once we're done. It might seem, uh, again, a little gratuitous. It might also feel like we're desecrating the corpses, but that's actively necessary, which is another part of Dead Space itself. One of the things that the creatures within this game tend to do is they like to play dead so that you move past them so that they can leap upon you in surprise and possibly try to impale or attack you. So frequently, one of the things that you will do is you will wind up stomping on them as you're in the middle of battle, not only to make sure that they're dead and they're not going to come up at you, but also in some cases, as you can see right there, to acquire additional items, whether that's health pack or credits or, or ammunition, whatever it happens to be, frequently stomping on a, a body will wind up releasing whatever that, that person or that monster happened to have been carrying at that particular time so that you can then use it and possibly make your way a little bit farther along. So now that we managed to get through some of the initial battles, we find ourselves uh, meeting back up with Kendra and Zack, two of the survivors that came on the Ishimura with us first, which is also a nice little demarcation from the original game. In the original, it really was basically you as Isaac going off and making your way to the Ishimura essentially alone and stumbling into the mystery and figuring out what happened to be going on on this massive ship by yourself, which kind of heightened this isolation and, and this, this sense of dread that constantly built over time. With the remake in many ways, though, you have more of a sense that you're not alone. There are other people that are depending upon you to do some of the tasks that you have, which makes the tasks that you're doing not feel as random as they might in, in previous situations. So for instance, you might be tasked with, in this particular case, trying to get the tram to get uh, working so that uh, Kendra and Zach can move forward and try to figure out what else happens to be going on in the issue more and advise you in other places. But that also kind of gives you a sense that the structure of the missions are not always going to be as static as, as you would expect from one game to the next. It's going to change. It's going to, to uh, rotate from place to place. Now, one of the other things about Dead Space is it really kind of captures, again, that sense of isolation, but also the sense of scares. If you happen to be afraid of the dark, you happen to be afraid of tight spaces, this probably isn't going to be the game for you because it really plays on the sense that anything could be coming out at you from the shadows. These monsters love to just hop out of absolutely seemingly nowhere. They will come at you from the vents. They will come at you from the sides of catwalks. They'll drop at you from, from the ceiling. In many ways, you always have to keep your eyes uh, scanning the environment because as as you can see right there, that particular monster just literally came out of nowhere and we walked right past it. It would have swiped at us if we weren't very careful. In some cases, you'll always have to keep an eye out because sometimes you'll need to turn the lights off so that you can get access to other places, thereby heightening that tension and making things a little bit creepier. Now, what we're also seeing on screen is one of the really interesting parts about Dead Space, which is that a lot of the on-screen HUD has been reduced to, in some cases, keeping the, the health meters on your back. So the spine kind of gives you an idea of how much health you happen to have. If it's at the top, then you're pretty healthy, but if it's red and at the bottom, then you're almost close to death. We're, we've managed to uh, pause this particular necromorph in front of us with a stasis charge, giving us a little bit more time to uh, aim our weapon and cut off some of the limbs, getting additional space so that we have uh, the ability to uh, stay alive a little bit longer. 
Now, one of the really interesting things, of course, is that uh, when you start out or you find a weapon or you find some gear, it's not always going to be the best. Now, one of the obvious things that you look for within a survival horror game is being able to augment or boost the weapons and the gear that you happen to have. And what you'll do is take whatever you have to a workbench. Here is where you wind up boosting and augmenting the items you have using the uh, electrical schematics that you see right here. What you have is uh, different nodes on the, the blueprint for that particular piece of gear. So the ripper, the, the plasma cutter, the pulse rifle, the uh, suit that you happen to be wearing that keeps you alive. And as you wind up placing additional nodes, you'll wind up uh, gaining uh, the ability to have more ammunition, to cause more damage, to have additional health and armor, whatever it happens to be. So you take whatever gear that you don't use or that you're not particularly interested in, you'll wind up going to different stores that are scattered around the Ishimura. And you'll trade that in so that you could possibly possibly buy or, or find additional nodes that you can then take to workbenches and then use that to augment the gear that you happen to have. In this particular case, we're also going to show off some of the differences within some of the items. For instance, we were using the plasma cutter, but it just really wasn't that effective for something that moves very, very quickly. So we're going to switch over to something in a very close quarter situation, such as using the Ripper, which essentially levitates a saw blade that moves at a very, very high rate of speed. We can use that to launch uh, those saw blades at, at a creature, especially if we know that we have it within our sights, or we can just keep it levitating in place and then move forward as if it was basically like a, a spinning, floating chainsaw, thereby dissecting that creature as it as it happens to be in front of us. Now. You're not always going to be in the safest of situations. Of course, the Ishimura is a very large ship, but it's suffered a lot of damage. As you can see right here, some of the hull has been completely ripped away, thereby depressuring some areas of the ship itself. So sometimes you'll be forced to move through different places without a lot of oxygen, trying to make your way through before you wind up suffocating because of the lack of air. In other cases, however, you may have to work in zero gravity. In this particular case, we're in a location that has a lot of uh, power conduits and other things like that, but some of the areas that we, we need to access aren't always uh, connected from one place to the other or, or have different uh, areas that, that are easily accessible. In that case, we need to use our thrusters to then navigate through zero gravity. And in this case, it's literally, you can move up, down, side to side, but also in all different uh, degrees of motion. So you could completely spin around because a node could be up on the ceiling or on the floor or somewhere else that's a, a large distance away and you need to use your thrusters to navigate those areas. In this particular case, as you can see right here, we even have to rotate our perspective around so that we can then eventually get back to what would be the floor so we could activate the magnets in our boots to then sink back into whatever would be uh, a space that had artificial gravity engaged so that we can then collect some of the items that we were looking for. And this particular case, we managed to find our, our space or our way to a, a workspace that has a canister that we need so that we can make it a, a little additional progress within the earlier part of the game. Of course, it's never going to be that easy. And even as we use some of the uh, the uh, uh, important electrical equipment that we have to grab items from a distance, uh, of course, it's not as easy as it's going to seem. Sometimes you'll you'll use some of the, the gear that you have to acquire items, but of course, Finding tanks, finding schematics, finding gear frequently also opens you up to attack because as you're getting those items, the monsters and the necromorphs will then find their own way to figure out where you happen to be. And you'll only feel that you're safe when the objective completed sign kind of pops up in your HUD and lets you know that. In this particular case, you can see that some monster has crawled out of the vents and is swimming its way through zero gravity to our location. The Ripper really wasn't working. Neither was the the uh, plasma cutter, so we switched to a pulse rifle, which is essentially just a high-powered rifle that sends out a large number of rounds. But as you can see, even blasting that thing, it is still alive and crawling to us with its one good arm that was still attached. Of course, zero gravity means it could basically have the corpse and everything kind of floating at us, giving you more of a sense of the horror that you're going through. Now, speaking of horror, as you can see right here, this is one of those intense, violent situations that you could see. Uh, this doctor seems to be operating on somebody who 
plausibly was still alive at the time that she decided to start operating. But then again, and this is also a, a trigger warning right here, whatever it is that she has seen is way too much and she decides that she wants to kill herself. Again, as we mentioned at the very beginning of this, uh, there's a lot of intense uh, situations that you're going to go through when you're playing this game as you wind up figuring out what exactly happened to the Ishimura, what happened to the people on this mining vessel, what exactly is going on. But that by and of itself is also another reason to for Isaac and the rest of the members of his crew to find any survivors if they possibly can and get off the ship as quickly as possible so that they don't succumb or become the latest casualties to whatever is going on on this ship. Of course, that gives you more of a reason to try to run or make your way through this as quickly as possible, but of course, it's not that simple. In fact, as we're just walking through this hallway, something winds up happening, it depressurizes this particular hallway, and we're now in a circumstance where until the, the uh, latches fall down, we were starting to vent air and we were going to have to find a way to, to uh, get some air or we'd suffocate. Unfortunately for us, of course, that also means other necromorphs like that head with tendrils leap in and try to attack us, making a very, very uh, tense situation even even uh, more heightened. Now, of course, we're coming towards the end of the video, but it wouldn't be a sci-fi horror game unless you had a flamethrower and possibly a nest that you had to fight your way through. If you've seen the Alien franchise, of course, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But in this particular case, uh, <laughs> the flamethrower comes at a particular moment which feels uh, appropriate. As you can see, uh, this part of the ship is definitely not on the baseline schematics. It is secreted from something. It is clearly oozing and, and gelatinous. There's something that is caking the walls with some kind of viscera. And even as we have to slide our way through or, or squeeze our way past whatever we happen to be in, the entrails and, and the bodies, the skeletons of some of the former crew members happen to be plastered into the walls, there is something seriously wrong here. And in fact, uh, as we get a little bit closer, we'll notice that not every single thing within this area happens to be dead. In fact, that creature, that half torso, whatever it is, is still very much alive. But then again, the walls were alive. It's pulsing. It's shuddering. And even as we wind up leaving that particular section towards the tail end of this video, all of a sudden, this massive tendril winds up grabbing Isaac. And it's basically this really odd, uh, slow but, but inexorable drag for, where Isaac has to fight for his life, and if he doesn't wind up uh, blasting the tendril off of him, well, for all we know, he could quickly and easily become another addition to that particular section of wall. But fortunately for us, at that particular moment, we wind up blasting that tendril off of him, and we're gonna leave it right there for now. Will Isaac and the rest of his crew manage to make it off? That's something that you'll have to see if you choose to play Dead Space. But for more top picks and advice to fit your family, be sure to always go to commonsensemedia.org.